Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I am Viral Vigela, and I'm the account manager for X-ray CT technology with Regaku. I'm here with our co-presenters, Angela Criswell and Aya Takasi. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for attending Regaku's webinar series, Ask the Expert. The best way to learn something new is talking to an expert. Our series will cover various topics and will be joined by industry experts to help us better understand CT techniques. Today, we want to welcome Dr. Chandra Reedy as our expert. Dr. Reedy serves as a professor in the Biden School at University of Delaware and is the director of his Center for Historic Architecture and Design. She also holds a joint appointment as professor in the Department of Art History and affiliated faculty member in Asian Studies and Anthropology. She will be discussing how to perform quantitative analysis of CT data to extract meaningful and trustworthy information about ancient and historic ceramics. But before we begin, a few housekeeping items. As far as today goes, this is going to be an interactive session and I'll be posting relevant links in the chat window. We'll be taking your questions live during the webcast and answer them during the session. So please don't wait until the end to ask. Please submit those questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We won't be monitoring the raised hand functions and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can during the webinar and any unanswered questions will be responded to directly after the session is completed. If for whatever reason you have difficulty viewing the webinar live, please note it is being recorded and you will be able to view the recording beginning tomorrow. With that being said, let me turn it over to Angela and Aya. Welcome everyone and thanks so much Chandra for joining us here today to talk about ancient ceramics. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, are you ready to go with your slides? Yes. Excellent. All right, so we'll be uh, following the usual uh, program where we're going to ask our expert a few questions and we're going to get started with the first one. Uh, and we want to know, Chandra, what are ceramic cultural materials and how does CT contribute to our understanding of these? Well, ceramic cultural materials can include a lot of different things. They're defined as objects made primarily of clay with additives to improve drying and firing properties like sand, straw, ground rocks, shells, or ground up sherds from broken objects. And then this mixture is then fired, generally anywhere between about 600 degrees C up to about 1400 degrees C. There are ceramic architectural materials such as bricks, roof tiles, and decorative terracotta elements on buildings. There are statues, figurines, or other decorative art objects. And also, of course, a wide variety of ceramic vessels with many different surface decoration techniques designed for storage, cooking, serving, eating, or drinking. And that includes glazed teawares or tablewares. Some people use CT of whole objects to look at forming methods. For example, looking where separate pieces were joined or to study the working methods of potters, how they tended to form various parts of a vessel. For myself, I'm currently using micro CT of archeological sherds or samples taken from them, especially for quantifying porosity, which gives information about how well objects are designed for specific functions and use properties, gives clues about production methods and provides insights about potential deterioration. Are there any questions at this point? Uh, we have a question uh, and it goes, where are the oldest uh, ancient ceramics found and how are these dated? Oldest ceramics, well, as far as I know, um, they, the earliest are dated to about 28,000 BC, so late Paleolithic, from the site of Dolne Vestonitz in the Czech Republic. And these aren't vessels at that early of a date, but they were small ceramic animal and female figurines, and also some small ceramic balls that seem to have been added to the fire while they're still very wet so that they would explode. And that seems to be their purpose. And these are dated through archeological context and association with 
charred wood, plant remains, bones, and other kinds of organic materials that can be used for radiocarbon dating. And there was an interesting article some years back in Science about this site. 28,000 is a long, long time. That is old. Very old. It's very yeah. fascinating. All right. So then uh, our next question for you, Chandra, is when you're working with these materials, what are the challenges? It's, it's particularly with CT. Well, one challenge is that impact objects can't ethically be sampled. So where you have whole objects, that means scanning the entire object, which does limit the spatial resolution achievable and therefore has to direct which research questions you can answer by this technique. And that would mainly be a concern for scientists working in a museum, especially an art museum. But we most often have archeological shards and they're found in very large numbers at many archeological sites. So then we have to decide on sample size and field of view, which governs the spatial resolution that's possible and therefore affects which research questions we can reasonably tackle. Then we have to think about the questions that we want to investigate and decide on how many replicates to include and how those replicates should be defined. For example, if the field of view is small and the shared material is very inhomogeneous, then you're going to need more within shared replicates than you would for a homogeneous material. And another complication is that for given ceramic ware, even from one ancient kiln site, there were usually many separate kilns constructed. And then each one of those, of course, had many production runs over the period when the site was active. So multiple sherds are going to be needed to begin to reliably characterize a ceramic type. Another challenge is that most archaeological ceramics have a variety of types of non-clay particles, such as organic matter or crushed rocks or sand with quartz, feldspars, micas, and iron oxides, and many other minerals present. And it's difficult using micro CT alone to differentiate all of those different minerals from each other, and sometimes even from the ceramic matrix, since there can be a lot of overlapping densities. Identifying all of the specific particles present then usually requires other techniques. And the difficulties with differentiating many phases in micro CT scans can limit the questions you can ask about the size, shape, and distribution of all of those particle types. For example, on the upper left is a micro CT scan of a ceramic sample with a 0.5 centimeter field of view and 10 micron spatial resolution. We can see that there are a lot of silica mineral grains. They're unevenly distributed and they range widely in size and shape. With a bit of effort, the white denser quartz particles can be distinguished from other particles, but it's very difficult to separate out all of the other particle types from each other. It's a lot easier to just segment pores versus all silica particles versus ceramic matrix, um, as was done in the upper center image. I use the Dragonfly software by Objects Research Systems for my 3D segmentation and image analysis. The lower images show that with petrographic thin sections, for example, it's much easier to identify all the mineral phases using both plain polarized light on the left and cross polarized light on the right. And here we can identify a granodiorite rock fragment in the center with both quartz and plagioclase feldspars. It's even easy to distinguish and identify very small grains within the matrix. But beyond identification of what's there, measuring the average and range of sizes and shapes and the distribution accurately really requires a 3D technique. So far, I've been focusing more on pore systems, uh, which have been neglected in archaeological ceramic studies, and they provide a lot of information and are pretty easy to segment from everything else in micro CT images as on the right. So then we can quantify all of the various pore system properties in the material. Are there any questions? Yeah, we got a question in the chat. Um, how can you prepare replica samples? 
Um, well, what I do is I take a shirt and I um, take a, a slice from different parts of the, the shirt. Um, and then in terms of replicate shirt samples, you would look for uh, things, shirts from the same site that appear to be the same type of um, ceramic material and pick uh, a couple of different shirts to uh, analyze. Okay, and you mentioned different uh, particles and phases, um, you know, size, shape. Um, how many different phases um, do we should we expect in a ceramic, uh, typically? Well, sometimes you're lucky, and there'll be just one type of clay that's pretty clean and maybe has a fine quartz-rich silt or sand component, and then one non-clay additive that's also pretty clean, such as chopped straw or crushed shell. But most of the time, you're gonna find a lot of different um, phases present. There'll be um, a variety of impurities in the clay and uh, maybe a complex additive that has a, a lot of different minerals or maybe a couple of different additives mixed together. So you might find various feldspars, micas, iron oxide materials and other things. And so sometimes between the um, clay and the additive, you can get as many as 12 or 15 different phases, but then additional phases can form during firing. For example, at high enough temperatures, quartz will transform to cristobalite and then eventually silica glass and feldspars to mullite. So these phase transformations can help in hypothesizing possible firing temperatures. Sounds like you got to pick and choose what you want. Yeah, it's, it's innumerable phases. So yeah. Just... <laughs> That's why it's hard with micro CT. Yeah. For sure. All right. Oh, the next question is for you, the audience. Okay. So we're going to have a couple of questions throughout the webinar today for the audience. But let me start the first one. Okay. So question number one. Have you done any micro CT imaging of archaeological or ethnographic ceramic materials? You might say yes. And if you say no, uh, we have three possibilities we guessed. Um, so you might say no, but I've used the micro CT to study modern ceramics, or you've used it to study other kinds of materials, or you might be considering using uh, micro CT in the future. Answers are coming in pretty fast. I don't see yes answer yet. I'm going to give you a few more sure. seconds to think about it. Oh, there's one. Oh, there's <laughs> one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> nice. But two thirds of you have answered it. Um, so I'm going to close the poll in three, two, one. Then let me share the results. So 59% of you said it, no, you haven't used it for those materials, but um, I guess you did this for other kinds of materials. And after that, um, the following answer was considering using micro CT in the future. And a few of you said um, you use it for modern ceramics and one said, yes, you use for archeological and ethnographic ceramic materials. Great. Okay, I'm gonna well, stop sharing. <laughs> I'm sorry, Angela, we're gonna no, say. No, no. I, I'm just saying, even if you don't uh, use it today or using it for different materials, many of these same things we're gonna talk about today are gonna apply to, to other types of data analyses for sure. And that's why we're so happy to have Chandra here talking about this. It's true, it's a poor analysis, right? Can be Correct. used for many different things, yeah. Support. Absolutely. All right, so let's get on to our next question. And it's a it's a really good one about, we're talking about Chandra's approach here. So what is your standard operating procedure when you're planning data collection and analysis for these types of materials? Well, 
first I think about, well, taking advantage of the strengths of micro CT imaging, what do I want to know about this group of ceramics that we don't already know? And why would that be interesting or useful to know? And then what kind of data am I going to need to collect to figure that out? The answers to those questions direct the sampling strategies, what range of sherds and how many replicates, as well as the micro CT imaging protocols and the image analysis strategy. Since there's been very little research done studying poor systems of archaeological ceramics by 3D image analysis of micro CT data, any new project often has to start with a pilot study of exploratory research that can help in refining future research designs. For example, when I first started using micro CT for porosity studies of ceramics, I wasn't sure what field of view to use. On one hand, I wanted to achieve as fine a spatial resolution as possible because I know that small pores are important. But on the other hand, many ancient and historic ceramics also have some large pores and a lot of variability. So if the field of view is too small, then the image isn't going to be very representative. Since achievable voxel size is limited by sample size with smaller fields of view giving better spatial resolution, there had to be a trade-off then between imaging the smaller pores and the representativeness of a heterogeneous material and its larger pores. We have a Rigaku GX130 instrument and for that, with a 2.5 centimeter field of view, spatial resolution is then limited to 50 microns. That does give a good view of the material, but I was pretty sure that the spatial resolution wasn't going to be good enough. But I was unsure if a one centimeter field of view at 20 microns spatial resolution would be better or worse than a 0.5 centimeter field of view at 10 microns resolution. So in my first two exploratory studies, I imaged all samples at both fields of view and then repeated the same image analyses for both sets of data. Then my data scientist, Kara Reedy, did the same statistical analyses for both. It was a lot of tedious additional work, but it was useful because the statistical analyses for both projects clearly showed that the finer spatial resolution gives better results. The more poor variables were useful in answering the research questions. I also found that for very heterogeneous materials like brick, at least five replicate samples from each brick were needed to capture the full range of variability. But with more homogeneous fine-grained ceramic sherds, two are usually sufficient. So now I'm more confident going forward for future projects, and I can have a more streamlined, less duplicative research design for the future. Are there any questions at this point? Uh, we got a question, uh, but before we ask, there is a link in the chat uh, to read the study uh, and uh, review it in more detail. Uh, uh, our audience can take a look at it at their convenience. Uh, the question here is, does porosity change with age or weathering, and how can we tell a difference between uh, use or aging? Well, that's a good question, and it's something that still needs more experimental work, I think, to understand better. For architectural materials like brick that undergo environments such as repeated freeze-thaw cycles while water is trapped in the pores, that can we know that can expand the pores and increase the pore network. Archaeological ceramics buried in the ground will have widely differing experiences depending on how much exposure they have to the groundwater. And that can vary a lot, even within an, a specific site. More research with laboratory prepared samples and also with objects from traditional ceramic workshops, I think is needed to better understand how porosity changes with various types of uses and the lengths um, for which an object is being used. I was I was just gonna I, I had a brick in my trash can, um, outdoor trash can in the backyard, 
And I just emptied it out and it was filled with water because of all the rain we got a couple of weeks ago. And it's definitely a different size than uh, what I put it in beforehand. So uh, <laughs> we'll see at least saw that live. <laughs> water is a big deteriorating mechanism. Of course. Yeah, I would imagine for sure. All right. Uh, so we'll go to our next question for Chandra. And it's actually a question for you, the audience, yet again. <laughs> All right, Aya, take it away. Okay. So question number two. So let me start the polling. Okay. So the next question we have for you is, how many poor variables do you think might be useful to quantify when studying the poor systems in traditional ceramic materials? Trick question. So for the answers, you might say zero. I hope not, but <laughs> or one to ten, or ten to twenty-five, or more than twenty-five. You would have think that the pores are just pores, and there are not that many things to analyze about. But you might be surprised. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. About one and a half, maybe about two thirds of you answered the question. I hope everybody else is still awake. Okay, I'm gonna give you a few more seconds. <laughs> I'm gonna close the poll in three, two, one, and share the results. So the majority, or more than half of you, think it's one to 10. And following that, um, more than 25. And the third um, most popular choice was 10 to 25. So which one is the right answer, Chandra? Well, actually, the more than 25, as you're going to see in a moment. There are a lot of variables. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Well, hopefully the next question will address some of these, these uh, different uh, characteristics. So then the next question um, is, how do you choose meaningful parameters to quantify during CT analysis, Chandra? Well, for my first micro CT analysis of ceramic pores, I really didn't know what might be useful. So to get an idea of which parameters might be useful to record, I surveyed the literature on porosity studies of bricks and ceramics, whether made by traditional methods or modern ones, to see what variables other people were recording and no matter which analytical method they were using. And so then I listed all of those parameters from about 100 papers. And as a result, I ended up collecting data on close to 150 variables, which is actually not overly difficult because in the Dragonfly software, you can collect data on many of those simultaneously once you've segmented the pores. Although I suspect the analyses are more of a pain for my data scientists. But in the end, fewer than about a third of those Poor parameters turned out to actually help in answering my questions for that first study. So then I focused down on that subset for future work, but not all of those prove useful every study. So it depends on the ceramic materials and the research questions. The main thing of importance is to Think about and understand why certain variables might be important for a given study. For example, some pore system parameters can be related to raw materials and fabrication methods. When clays are coarsely ground and coarsely sieved, as on the upper left, with coarse additives and then fired at relatively low temperatures, the sherds tend to have high pore conductivity values. And this can be both visualized and quantified in Dragonfly by viewing the segmented pore systems as graph models of the system with spheres representing the pores and lines between them, the pore connections, as we see on the right here. The high connectivity can be partially explained by the partial burning out of organic material, dissolution of partially melted feldspars, cracking of quartz grains, and other kinds of firing effects on those large particles that tend to be more numerous in low-fired 
coarsely prepared materials, as we see in the thin sections on the lower left here. And this creates many locations where intragranular pores are in contact with each other and with some adjacent intergranular pores in common, raising the overall connectivity values. There are a lot of pores here. Most of them are connected to at least three other pores and some to a lot more than that. And only a very few are isolated pores. In contrast, when the raw materials are more finely ground and sieved and perhaps levigated in water to remove more of the large impurities as we see being done on the upper left here, have finely ground additives and firing is done at high temperatures and sometimes for long periods of time, more of the grains then will completely melt and vitrify and a dense glassy matrix forms, filling in and breaking up many of the previously connected pores and then forming new round isolated pores as gas bubbles get released during vitrification, as we see in the thin sections on the lower left. In the graph of this pore system on the right here, we see there aren't very many pores in the system. Few of them are connected to a large number of pores, most to just one other pore. And there are also many isolated pores visible, not connected to any others. In fact, 15% of all the pores in the system here are isolated pores. So if we think carefully about the things like the effects of raw material choices, how they might be processed, how an object might be formed and firing regimes, we can begin to figure out which parameters might be useful to quantify with a CT analysis. Are there any questions at this point? Yeah, we've got a couple of questions, uh, Chandra. Uh, one of them is, I'm going to just tell you both and then you can just, you know, give your answer. The first one is, uh, how can we determine the pores which are linked between overlap particles due to surface abrasion? And the second one is, would any artifact occur, artifacts occur? And how do you deal with artifacts when you're uh, you know, picking out pores and connected pores? Okay, so the first is, um, how do you tell things that are just on the surface, surface abrasion, not a specific pore? Um, you can um, exclude the very surface from your region of interest for analysis. You're actually only analyzing the ceramic body itself. And that's that would be one way to do that if you have a lot of um, surface abrasion because those would usually be dips into the surface. So you can exclude those um, when you construct your region of analysis for image analysis and segmentation. And the other one, is that about um, artifacts, like imaging artifacts? I'm gonna yeah. guess, yeah. Okay, so I well, I did a lot of experimentation with the types of materials that I was um, using for micro CT scanning and different, um, protocols to find the best protocol to um, ensure there wouldn't be any artifacts in there. So it's really your um, doing the best possible imaging practice. Uh, and there are there are if you're getting some artifacts like rings, um, you can uh, there's software to exclude those to remove those. You can do that in Dragonfly, and also there's some in the Rigaku instrument that I'm using. Yeah, uh, artifacts are such a challenge. And I would imagine for some of your bright, dense materials, they can also uh, create some artifacts that make you scratch your head some days. Um, you, we also did a, uh, a webinar and a workshop on artifacts as well. Filters are good, changing the energy and right. So fine tuning your experiment is extremely important, like Chandra mentions. Um, so yeah, I'm just fascinated that you can tell how, whether they're sifting the materials or not, just by looking at the of a tiny shard uh, many thousands of years later, fascinating. All right, so let's look at our next question. And again, it's a polling question for all of you guys. So we'll take a short break with Aya. Okay. Um, this is going to be the last question uh, we have for the audience. So let me start the polling first. 
Okay. So the question is, what type of pour system might be good for a cooking pot used to over an open fire? I have no idea, but there are many different combinations or types of pores. So one with many large connected pores or one with just a few small connected pores or one with many large pores with a high percentage that are isolated or one with a few small pores with a high percentage that are isolated. You kind of have to picture them to, I guess, yeah, figure out dude. which one would be good for a cooking pot. Yeah, I'm thinking of other materials for insulation and thinking they might, uh, the same concepts might apply here. Mm -hmm. So more than a half of you, about two thirds answered. It seems like a third of you are either asleep or don't know the answer. Maybe you, maybe the one uh, that you have in your mind is not one of the choices. That's a possibility. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna close the poll in three, two, one, and share the results. It's kind of split among the four choices, but the winner is one with a few small pores with a high percentage that are isolated. Well, let's find out. Well, actually the first choice there, many large connected pores is the correct answer. And I'll be talking about why that is um, in the next few slides. So I think you'll get a good, good idea um, after you see some actual images of these. Great. So with that, we'll go to our next question. And uh, the one I'm definitely most looking forward to, I want to know what properties are the most telling about how a given material was made or used. Well, actually, there are many statistical properties relating to pore size and shape, for example, that give clues about how the ceramic was made. And on the upper left here, the pores are color coded by a measure of sphericity. The lower left plot shows a very strong correlation to firing temperature. Higher fired ceramics have more spherical and globular pores. And then in contrast on the right, uh, we see a measure of pore elongation that shows the opposite. Higher values are seen with lower firing temperatures. So parameters like these can be useful in estimating possible firing temperatures for archeological materials, especially when combined with dozens of other variables that are related to firing temperature and also to studies of the particles and matrix properties. If we assume that potters figured out through trial and error what raw materials, processing and fabrication methods and firing regimes would result in the products that work the best for certain uses, then regarding porosity, we can think, what does a cooking pot need? And actually it needs a good amount of porosity so that the non-clay particles can expand and contract on a cooking fire without the vessel cracking. And large connected pores will help retain heat in the vessel. And in Dragonfly, once we've segmented the pores, the silica particles and the matrix, if the particles and matrix for a set of shirts have also been identified through other methods, then the segmented 3D image can be used to compute effective thermal conductivity using the porous microstructure analysis plugin that was originally developed by NASA. Starting with estimated thermal conductivity of the individual components, such as quartz, feldspars, clays, and the air in pores, temperature fields are simulated in the X, Y, and Z directions. 
the steady state temperature is solved at every point, and the simulation output shows the effective thermal conductivity of the ceramic in watts per meter Kelvin in each direction. This is really a very fast method to assess how well a ceramic might have performed for certain uses. For example, teacups or tea bowls, like on the lower left, should have relatively high thermal conductivity to quickly take up heat from the hot liquid that's poured into it and distribute it evenly, but it will then begin to lose that heat to the environment, which is okay because they're usually for fairly short-term use just while the tea is being drunk. And I think we've all experienced uh, leaving our tea cup or coffee cup sitting out for very long and suddenly it's too cold. And uh, in contrast, Cooking pots that are designed for use on a wood fire or a coal stove, like we see in the lower center, should have lower thermal conductivity, which would be good for slow cooking dishes like stews that sit on a heat source for a long time simmering the contents. They take longer to heat up originally, but once these pots get warm, then they retain that heat well due to the insulating properties of the many large pores. So for example, sherds from cooking pots like the ones here are measured at an effective thermal conductivity averaging 0.381 watts per meter Kelvin, while a porcelain teacup sherd was 0.548. Are there any questions here? I think you mentioned matrix. Uh, there was a question earlier in, the, uh, in, in this uh, conversation. How, what's the best, or how do you kind of look into calculating the, the ceramic matrix uh, concentration? The con you mean the amount of matrix? Well, you can do that um, in the segmentation process in image analysis because the density of the matrix um, is going to be very distinguishable from that of the pores and of the particles that you find in there. Okay. You want to identify what the matrix is at, you know, which clay minerals you have there, then you need to um, do another method, uh, something like XRD, FTIR, Raman spectroscopy. Okay, so other techniques should be involved in that as well. Okay. There was a, a, another question, how do ancient ceramic properties differ from modern man-made mass-produced materials? Because I'm sure our audience was thinking that when they were answering that last poll question, so. <laughs> Well, there are a lot of differences. One is that um, ancient ceramics are always going to have more variability within a production run and within a site, certainly, and even among different potters um, at one site um, compared to modern mass produced wares made in a factory that can be very consistent. And modern ceramics also make use of uh, various synthetic ingredients available today, whereas ancient ceramics are made with natural ingredients, such as just clay and um, minerals and straw, that sort of thing. And also modern kilns and furnaces uh, can achieve higher temperatures and much more controlled firing regimes than can be found with ancient firing methods. Thank you. Interesting. Yeah. I wonder if that influenced how and when they made it. So maybe on a warm day, a hot day, not a cold day, depending on when they fire things. I can imagine. Oh, and surprise, guys. This next slide indicates this is our lightning round. Uh, so this, uh, if you've not attended one of our Ask, Ask the Ask Expert series before, this is where we ask Andre a few questions and get to know her separate from the scientific uh, stuff that she does. And so our first question for you. Uh, no pressure. <laughs> Where did you get your professional degree? Well, I did my PhD at UCLA in an interdepartmental archaeology program that required students to work in at least three different departments. So I was one third anthropology, one third art history, and one third earth and space sciences. And then I actually did a lot of my dissertation research nearby at the Los Angeles County Museum of Arts Conservation Science Laboratory. So I have a very eclectic background. Yeah, but it sounds like so well-rounded and well-suited for what you're doing, like doing today. 
I'm curious, Chandra, if you had not decided to study ancient ceramics using a variety of uh, techniques, including CT, what else might you have decided to do? Well, I really don't have any idea what I would have ended up doing, but as a child, I was torn between two competing plans for what I would do when I grew up. And one was to become an astronaut and the other was uh, to become a detective. So probably the detective role is more likely. Yes, and, you, and it fits well, definitely, for sure. So what are some of your favorite findings uh, that you've observed while studying ancient ceramics? Well, my favorite part of this work by far is when I have a chance to do field work at places far away with a much different culture than the East Coast U.S. And I get to see and document some of the many amazing inventive ceramic technologies that people have developed around the world and have a chance to talk with the potters and kiln masters about their work. Sandra, I, I was wondering, uh, you've probably been everywhere in the field work. Uh, what is your favorite place that you've been to uh, in your experience over the last however many years you've been doing this? Well, definitely that would be um, some of the Tibetan areas in China that I've gone to, uh, Lhasa, Tibet, and three places um, in Sichuan province, the Aba Tibetan and Chang Autonomous Prefecture, Duge County in Garza Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture, and the Muli Tibetan Autonomous County. Those um, are really fascinating places to visit and people to talk to, and interesting ceramic tradition. And I, as well. I bet it's gorgeous there too. So a nice place to, to spend some time observing uh, how things are done there. Um, this will be our last question for Chandra, and I'm wondering what's your favorite science book or maybe science show or movie? Well, I'm afraid I don't really watch many shows, but I really love to read, and I like reading biographies and autobiographies of women in science. Some of the best have been about people outside of my field, but I enjoy any any scientific field reading about that. I found Lab Girl by Hope Jaron, very inspiring. And most recently I enjoyed The Exceptions by Kate Zernike. It was a little depressing, but also a very fascinating look into the world of academic science. And then maybe it doesn't count, but Going back to my childhood wish to be a detective, the detective I wanted to be was Sherlock Holmes. And my dad had the complete works of Sherlock Holmes by Arthur Conan Doyle. So I read all of those many, many times. Excellent. And I'm sure you were really glad that uh, he wasn't, he didn't really die in that series. And they <laughs> was promptly brought back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sneaky one, sir, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. So <laughs> glad that didn't work out for sure. All right. Thanks so much for answering, uh, humoring us and answering our probing questions, Chandra. But we have to get back to the science now and uh, go to our next question. And Angela, and before you ask, uh, there was a question um, yes. from, from the audience. And it was one of the, I think, um, image that Chandra had shared on one of her slides. First question. Uh, how long the, the 0.5 field of view, centimeter field of view scan that you did, Chandra, uh, with 10 micron resolution, or do you recall what energy, voltage, power you might have used uh, on your settings? 130 kV, yeah. 61 current. And um, usually I go for 57 minutes after gotcha. um, a full warm up and gain calibration of the instrument. That gives gotcha. the best results for my instrument for these ceramics. Gotcha. Thank so you. that would be you're using a fine focus in that case. Oh, yeah, so definitely. With that setting for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Sorry. All right. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for your question. Um, and this is our last question for Chandra today, although you still have time to answer, to uh, sorry, ask some yourself. 
So uh, we're going to wrap up by asking Chandra what advice she has when you're designing experiments to characterize archaeological samples for which we have uh, no idea of their history. Well, anytime you're analyzing micro CT images of archaeological ceramics, there are a lot of unknowns about the history of that object. We don't know for sure where the clay and the additives were collected or how they were processed. There's a lot of unknowns about the object fabrication process and the drawing and firing history. We don't know anything about the intended function or who it was intended for, how often and how long they used the object and how well it served that intended use. We can propose ideas about many of these questions by collecting and studying potential raw materials and by conducting comprehensive analyses on sherds, comparing those results to other similar projects. But knowing what to look for and making reasonable interpretations of the data requires more than just analyzing archaeological sherds. It helps to have some laboratory prepared standards to analyze as well, where you know what clay and additive you started with, uh, you know how they were mixed, what the production methods were, and you know the firing regime. And then seeing how those laboratory replicas appear in the image analysis is helpful for interpreting what you're seeing with the unknowns. We can even do accelerated weathering in the lab to see how pore systems might change over a lifetime of use and with long-term burial. But even that isn't sufficient. Even for a single site or region of use, there are an enormous number of possible variables. And we already know that replicates are necessary to catch the possible variation. There may be several types of clay with multiple deposits or collection locations, each with some variation in impurities. The clay could be prepared to varying degrees of fineness and multiple types or mixes of additives can also be ground to varying fineness and added in varying amounts. Sometimes multiple object fabrication methods can be used for a single object or certainly at one site. Drying regimes can vary. Firing temperatures can vary. And while the highest temperature achieved is important, there can also be variations in the length of time spent at the highest temperature, and then in the rates of ramping up the temperature and cooling down. All of these factors can change the internal structure of the ceramic, as can a long period of use and burial. So if we try to account for all of these factors and combinations of factors with replication in the laboratory, we'd be talking about an enormous number of samples to prepare and analyze. So really the best we can do is to pick out what we think are the most important things to vary and then get a general sense of how those affect the micro CT and image analysis results. An important step to bridge the laboratory knowns and the archaeological unknowns is ethnographic field research, which means studies on site at traditional pottery workshops where these still exist. And here we can observe firsthand exactly what raw materials they use, how they prepare them, all of the steps of fabricating an object, and the firing regimes, and we can collect samples at each stage for micro CT and image analysis. We can also ask the potters and customers what the intended use is and how well different products function. And we can also collect sherds from broken and used objects where we know what they were used for and for how long. So when we're characterizing archeological ceramic sherds with micro CT and 3D image analysis, I try to incorporate that analysis with programs of ethnographic field research and the analysis of laboratory prepared samples for comparison, sort of a three-pronged approach, gives you better interpretations. Makes sense. Are there any questions here? Uh, there are. Uh, a couple questions. I'm going to go with the first one first and let you answer, and then I'll ask another question after. I think we still have a couple minutes. So uh, do you have guidance on 
potential for X-ray induced chemistry changes in archaeological ceramics under X-ray CT? Hmm. I haven't noticed that happening myself, but it's not something that I've studied. So um, if you're interested in that, there's room for research uh, there. But I haven't seen anything like that. Maybe Aya or Angela would have some insight. I've seen very few examples. Uh, there are, I've seen examples of x-ray induced changes, whether they're chemistry or some other effect that, you know, it's, it's hard to answer that question. Uh, but certainly movement caused by local heating, uh, for sure, I've seen. So uh, uh, how about you, Aya? I would think that it's very unlikely or rare to see a chemical change in inorganic materials mm -hmm. induced by just laboratory-based X-ray you know, generators um, and radiation. But... If you look at larger molecules like a protein and organic materials, you know the bonding is a lot weaker. So there is a possibility that the X-ray radiation can change something. Um, it's not chemical change, but color center excitation is pretty popular. If you have a glass on uh, salt after being exposed to X-rays, their uh, color can change, although it's uh, reversible. If you leave it, usually the color goes away, but that's yeah. not chemical change. I've seen that in resin embedded samples as well. Uh, so they the color change for sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then there's a two part question, I guess. Uh, and that is, uh, is there evidence of broken ceramics or building materials that can be recycled or reused in new materials? And does size or shape of a vessel tell us anything about its intended use? Well, definitely broken ceramics, um, broken bricks have been recycled and reused. Um, and that's called grog. And it make, if you crush pieces of grog, it makes a good additive to the clay to improve the drying and firing properties. So uh, you often see that. And um, the size or shape, what was it? Uh, and can you tell what it was by looking at a size or shape of a ceramic uh, and what was its intended use? Um, if you have um, the, enough shirts, so you have various parts uh, of a ceramic so you can reconstruct what the shape is, you often uh, can get clues about intended use, um, but it, that will usually be region specific and even site specific with um, certain sizes and shapes uh, indicating probable storage or cooking or drinking or serving vessels. And if local people are still using similar ceramics, that can give you more clues um, about how, you know, with what different, different shapes and sizes, what they're used for. And sometimes you know, you're lucky and you have wall paintings or painted ceramics where you can see ceramics in use. That gives you lots of evidence. And um, in fact, some people um, do analysis of organic residues on the inside of vessels like cooking vessels, um, which can help you determine exactly what was in those vessels, what, what they might've been used to cook for. This is all very interesting. <laughs> uh, I think there is one last, I think one more question is um, from your experience, how, how can, how micro CT quantify in cellulose, how can micro CT quantify in cellulose ma matrix? Have you done anything in that? Field? Oh, a little bit. Yes. Um, actually, I've looked at, wood samples there was a project looking at how oh that wood that had um been historic wood that had been contaminated in oil spills and different cleaning methods that were being used to see how well you could pull the oil out so i imaged some of those and actually it shows it's really shows up really well it's e a lot easier to image than ceramics with all the various particles mixed in there so um 
And I've also seen or, um, very large organic additives in some types of materials like clay core materials inside bronzes that were mixed with a lot of sort of woody particles to make them very porous. And you can see the um, shapes of the original materials really well. So I, I think this is a good technique for that. Excellent. Thank you. And just while looking at the questions, uh, the person who asked the questions about changes, chemical changes with x-ray exposure, uh, they do some electron beam analysis. So wanted to take uh, the opportunity to, to ask that question and uh, maybe make people aware. So mm -hmm. electron beams tend to have higher energy than an x-ray. So that can have a more effect. And most materials are more absorbent. That's than right. Electron yeah. beams and x-rays. So that, that means that you're more vulnerable to electron beams than x-rays. Oh yeah, absolutely. All right, so I think that's the end of our questions, the end of our time here with Chandra. Thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, we're going to hand this back to Viral. He's going to wrap things up uh, for us today. Well, thank you again, Chandra. This was extremely fascinating and, and a great uh, learning conversation today on ceramics. I, I learned a lot myself, uh, and I'm sure our audience did too. Um, but, you know, I also want to take this time to thank our audience for joining today's session. Uh, please join us next month for another topic as we meet with Roger Wendy from Hexacon Manufacturing at Volume, Volume Graphics. Uh, we will be discussing how to use CT for metrology and simulations. Till then, take care and keep scanning. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.